Hi, everyone. I'm Ario from the Authors at Google program, and it's uh, very happy to introduce Scott Birkin today, who's our speaker. He's going to be talking about public speaking, and uh, he's famous for just having great pieces that he writes on his blog, and he's written three excellent books for O'Reilly. So uh, please give, uh, give him a warm welcome, and I'll hand it off to Scott. How are you doing? Can you hear me okay? Volume good? Loud enough in the back? Still awake? Good? Excellent. Okay, so my first confession with you, the first confession I want to share with you is that I am not an extrovert. I am not someone who at the age of five told my mom, I want to be a public speaker when I grow up. That is not who I am. And the fact that I've written a book about public speaking is kind of an odd story. And the story goes something like this. I actually believe in ideas. I'm a creative person. I believe in ideas and learning about ideas and sharing them and trying to think better and share stuff that I find that's important or can make the world better. That is why I quit my job to write books. But a funny thing happens when you do anything interesting. A funny thing happens when you write and you, you write books is that people want you to talk about the stuff that you've written. And in all the stuff that I've done about the history of innovation, a lot of my work is on creative thinking and the history of how ideas become things and affect the world, is that's one of the threads that runs through all those stories too. Is that if you invent a, a cure for a disease, if you create something that earns a patent, eventually someone's going to want you to come and talk about those ideas and the quality of how you talk about your ideas is going to affect how they perceive the quality of the actual ideas themselves. So I've sort of, I've sort of stumbled backwards into becoming a public speaker and I recognize that if you care about ideas and you care about progress, that eventually your communication skills are really the gating factors to what you can make happen in the world. So I quit my job. I used to work at Microsoft. I, I worked on Internet Explorer in the, in the early days. But I quit my job at Microsoft in 2003 to write books. And as a side effect of writing books that have had the good fortune to be successful, I've done lots and lots of public speaking. I've been on national television. I've been on NPR. I've been flown all over the world to give lectures on stuff, basically, that I had written about. Which, if you think about it, is a really kind of lousy reason to hire someone to speak. Because just because you can write well has almost no bearing on the fact that you can speak well. So over the course of the last 10 years or so, I've probably given hundreds of lectures. I've taught college courses. I've taught workshops. I've been on all different kinds of media. And because I care about ideas, I've become someone who cares a lot about communication. And I felt like of all the books I had seen or come across about public speaking, they all tend to be very dry and kind of generic. And I know from my own mistakes that I have all these fantastic stories of doing really stupid, embarrassing things in front of other people. And I've learned from those mistakes how to do this stuff well. And that's what the book is about. It's a, a capturing of all the stuff that I have, um, all the stuff that I've talked about, um, all the stuff that has gone wrong for me and what the lessons are that can be learned from anyone else. Now, for any of you who are following along, any, any Twitterers here, any Twitter users, anybody, a couple of you? If you want to tweet as we're going, you want to blog as you're going, you want to take pictures of me or send smoke signals, you're free to use whatever media you want at all because I'm here promoting the book. So feel free to distract yourself from what I'm saying if you're going to talk about what I'm doing to people who aren't here. Now, the first thing you should know about public speaking, first thing you should know is that we are all public speakers, that everyone speaks all the time. And on average, the average American says about 12,000 words a day. 12,000 words a day. Now, of course, since there's no actual average person, there's probably no one person who just says 12,000 words. Some people say as few as five. Some people say as many as 20. We all have a friend who probably says more than 20,000 words a day that we'd rather that they didn't. But we're all speakers. And in ordinary lives, the fact that you have a job, the fact that you have friends, the fact that you have a girlfriend or boyfriend, the only way that you communicate and share life with them is through speaking and telling stories and explaining what it is you're trying to do with your life. So we are all inherently good speakers. Anyone who's listening to this conversation, listening to me talk right now, we're all good speakers. The problem, though, is as soon as you get into an environment where you are like I am right now, at the front of the room with a microphone with a bunch of people who you don't know staring at you, all the dynamics start to change. It gets kind of weird now. You feel judged. You feel you're going to be challenged. You feel vulnerable. And because of those feelings, your natural abilities to tell stories and to communicate clearly diminishes. The other problem that we have when it comes to public speaking is that most of the public speaking that we experience in our lives, in high school and in college, is really bad. Like most public speaking is bad. It's boring. It's dull. There's a reason why the word lecture is not a compliment. It's kind of an insult. It's a pejorative. People say, stop lecturing me. 
So we know that there's all these bad habits that most people have when they speak. But whenever we, it's our turn, whenever most people get the opportunity to be up in front of a room, the thing they do is repeat all the same mistakes they saw other people do because they think that's just how it's done. So what I'm going to do for the next 20 minutes or so, I'm going to give a very, I'm going to pick the stuff that most bad speakers do and explain to you how not to do it, which is the easiest, most low-hanging fruit way in the world to get better at being a speaker. And the first one, actually, before I, before I jump into the... Um, before I jump into the first one, these are the six I'm going to talk about. It'll take me about 25 minutes to get through all this stuff, and then we'll have about 20 minutes or so for Q&A. So as I'm going along, if I'm not talking about the thing you hoped I would talk about when, I came, when you came into this room, keep that in the back of your mind, and we'll have plenty of time at the end to talk about those things that I didn't get to. So these are the six things, the six things that most bad speakers do. Now the first one is the obvious one, which has to do with fear of public speaking. So how many of you get nervous before you give a pitch or talk at a meeting or give a lecture? How many of you have a fear of public speaking? Just raise your hand. Okay. So that's about 70% of you. So the rest of you are liars. You are liars. And the reason you're liars is not necessarily because you're fully aware that you're lying, but there's a fact that's biological that explains the fear response people have when they're speaking. And it has to do with the oldest part of your brain, a part of your brain is called the amygdala, which is in the core of your brain. It's about the size of a peanut. And it's kind of scary when you think about this tiny part of your brain. That's what controls a lot of really important stuff. It controls your heart rate, controls your adrenaline, fight or flight response stuff. And we have very little control over it by design, by design, because the amygdala thinks it's smarter than you are. Now, evolutionarily speaking, millions of years ago, hundreds of thousands of years ago, that's where the programming for the amygdala was generated. If you were a creature standing alone on a field in front of a large crowd of other creatures who were staring at you that you didn't know, that would be bad. That would mean you're going to die or you're going to get eaten. That's what it would mean, one of those two things. So the creatures who found this cool and had a positive response to this stuck around and died. Those ancestors no longer are around anymore. The ones who are afraid of it, who are freaked out by that kind of environment, are the ones who run away, and those are our great-grandparents and great-grandparents, grandparents, whatever. We are descendant from that line of genetics. So that means that whenever you get up in front of a crowd, whenever you're going to pitch an idea to someone, even if it's in a small group, you're going to feel that fight-or-flight response kick in. Because biologically, your body's telling you, based on millions of years of programming, this is bad. This is dangerous. So you can't control that. You cannot entirely control that. And in all the research I did for, for the book, I could not find a single example, not one example, of a famous performer, a rock star, an athlete, anyone who performs regularly in front of crowds that did not admit they got nervous before they performed. It's a universal fact because it's biological. What this means, though, if you're going to speak, it means that sometimes you will be nervous for reasons that have nothing to do with how smart you are, nothing to do with how well you've prepared. It's a physiological response that you cannot control. So the first thing you have to do then is acknowledge, okay, I am going to be nervous. I can't shut that off. I have to take responsibility for all the things that I can take care of. I have to take responsibility for those. Now the first one, which is really obvious, if you think about it, is if your body's going to have a physiological response, you want to make sure you get exercise that day. The average American gets way below what their genetic disposition is for how much exercise they need to get. So if you actually exercise your body that morning and exhaust your body's natural fear response energy, that nervous energy, you'll be way calmer because your body is calmed down. So it's physiological. Physiological problem, solve it through physiological means. The other thing you have to think about are all the things that are within your control, which means like getting the place early, which helps your body calm down, that you're in the environment you're going to be speaking in. Or whatever material you use, you have to practice it. All, all the stuff that people tend to discount as being irrelevant to the fear, those are things you can control. You have, to make share, you have to make sure that you take care of those things. Now, the second thing that many speakers do that's a problem is that they allow themselves to be perceived as never having done what they're doing before. That they make it look like it's their first time. And no one in the world wants to be a guinea pig. No one wants to feel like they are the experiment. This is the first time this guy has ever done this demo. So that's why he hasn't figured out how it works. He's going to spend 10 minutes fiddling with his laptop. No one wants to feel that way. And although it's more of a superficial complaint about speakers in general, if you take the time to make sure that you practice all the things that you do, 
so it seems natural to you, it makes it much easier for people to follow along with whatever it is you're saying. So there's an obligation you have if you're speaking. You know, I have about, there's probably about 100 people in this room right now, and there's only one of me. If I'm going to spend an hour talking, that means there's 100 hours that are being spent by you listening. If I'm not going to practice for a couple of hours, then I am creating, you know, public speaking hour debt. Because there's 97 or 99 hours that are being spent by you and only one that's spent by me. If I don't practice, I'm effectively telling my one hour is more important than your 99. Which is really an offensive kind of way to think about public speaking. So anything you do, anything you, you're going to talk about, anything you're going to show, you have to practice it. So at least it feels natural to you. And it makes it easier for people who are going to follow along with whatever it is that you're going to say. My third point has to do with rhythm. Are any of you guys musicians? Even amateur musicians? Anyone play guitar? What do you play in the back? Guitar. Any drummers? Percussion? No drummers. We'll have to rely on you then, my friend. Do you play rhythm guitar? So, okay, there we go. All right. So, it turns out, and you, you'll know this, it turns out that most, we, we are all rhythmic creatures. We all have a heart rate that's relatively constant that gives us a, a steady pace for how we, how we absorb all the information that's out there when we're trying to pay attention. There's a, a beat that exists just within us. And one of the main problems in most lectures and most public speaking is that the pace is always really slow. Lectures are boring because the pace is slow. And that's a problem. But what's worse than a slow lecture is a slow lecture that's erratic. So I have a picture up here of a turtle for a reason. So turtles are slow. No argument there. Anyone want to argue about that? Turtles slow? Turtles are slow. I've never seen a fast turtle. The only thing worse, it, and I know in my life sometimes I get frustrated if I'm standing behind someone in line who's slow because I'm waiting for them to do their thing. I got to get past them. The only thing that's worse than being behind a turtle is being behind a turtle that's on drugs. So a turtle on drugs, turtle on drugs is still slow. You're not going to fix that through, through biochemistry. But turtle on drugs is now going to be erratic. So it's slow and erratic, which is much worse. Because slow and predictable means you at least know, okay, it's going to take a certain amount of time for this guy to get through his stuff, and then he's going to move on to the next thing. Slow and unpredictable means you're going to have this kind of experience, where you're going to be in the audience, someone's in the audience, you're going like, He's been going for 20 minutes. Like, has he started yet? What, what is he talking about? That's a, turtle on, that's a turtle on drugs. That's someone who's not figured out that there's pace and rhythm that's important anytime someone's speaking. And if the person speaking isn't controlling their pace and their rhythm in some way, it's very difficult for people to follow along. In, in doing research for the book, one of the angles I took was to look, dig up all the research that had been done about lecturing and all the cognitive psychology and the cognitive science about what goes on in our brains when we're listening to lectures. And to condense that down in a fairly unscientific and made-for-television kind of way, the best basic rule of thumb about attention is most people, if, on average, can pay attention for about five to ten minutes. That's a sweet spot number for if you're going to make rough assumptions about crowds of people, that's your number, five to ten minutes. So that means if ever you're giving a lecture, it's going to be a half hour, or you're giving a talk, or anything that goes longer than that. You have to be thinking about how to construct your material in units of five to seven minutes, creating a rhythm that's going to be easier for people to follow along with. Very basic. One mistake most people make, though, is when you're making, doing a presentation or giving a pitch, or usually use either Keynote or PowerPoint. Who has used Keynote or PowerPoint in the last week? Okay, most of you, right? The flaw is people usually think then in terms of slides. How many slides am I going to have? But a slide is not a measure of time. So if you're thinking about your presentation, oh, yeah, i got 30 slides. That seems about right. You could end up spending 20 minutes talking about one slide, or maybe go fast, go quickly through 30 slides and only, cover five, only do that in within five minutes. So you have to be thinking about the pace chronologically rather than in terms of the content and material. You're trying to make it easy for people to follow along through, through what you're going to say. The other bit of research that I dug up, which is pretty fun, although lecturing is the dominant form of communication that teachers use and professors have used for probably hundreds of years, there's been very little research done as to what's actually going on physiologically for people who are in the audience. So there's this guy, Bly, who's a professor and a researcher, who wrote this excellent book about all the science behind teaching. Not a surprise, because most of you probably went to college and you fell asleep in at least one class. I'm sure. How many of you fell asleep in at least one class? 
Yeah, this is part of the process, right? We know. But there's actually data. He's like, look, your bodies are clearly not built to be lectured to. We're built to hunt and gather and do all kinds of active things. And sitting and listening is entirely passive. So this means if you're a speaker, and again, you're speaking for a length of time, you have to do something to help people's natural physiology work with you rather than against you. So instead of being a turtle on crack or a turtle on drugs, where you have an inconsistent rhythm, you know, it doesn't really make any sense, you need to be constructing your stuff with a pace that at least is clear to you. Preferably, it's clear to whoever you're talking to, that you're telling them, I got five things to say, I'm going to spend 30 minutes going through those five, then at least people know there's a pace they can follow. One trick, one question I get asked a lot is what to do when people start losing interest? What do you do when people start tuning out? And my answer to that question is always the same. It's like people tune out all the time, especially today in 2009 with all the things we can carry with us that are fun distractions. People tune out all the time. Or they start thinking about, did I, wait, did I walk the dog this morning? I can't remember. Or what am I going to have for dinner tonight? There are all these things that run through people's minds. And that's fine. But if you don't provide a rhythm, you don't provide a pace, then when they tune out, they're probably gone for the entire lecture or the entire talk. If you provide some kind of rhythm, then you give a trigger that they'll hear. They'll go, oh, wait, oh, all right, I'm in a lecture now. What is he talking about? Oh, he moved on to the next point. OK. And there's some way for them to come back in. You never want to be in a position where you go on for 30 minutes and people who've tuned out, they have no, no way they can possibly come back in and join, join the rest of the crowd.